Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Welcome to the forum, April 13th, 2015. And today is exciting. We're into the primary season, and we have candidates among us. Don't, 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 don't look around. They're, they're here. They're here, okay? But we have candidates among us. This is the start of the candidate season within the forum season. So welcome. Today we'll be discussing three different positions in the Hillsborough School Board. Before we get to our guests that are kind enough to be here, a few items of business. Number one, today, just like every other day, only members of the forum can ask the speakers questions. Because we have a fair amount to cover today, questioners will be limited to 30 seconds, and answers will be limited to one minute. That's one minute per person if there's more than one candidate up here addressing the question. Now, I'm sorry if that's a little tight. We may have some extra time at the end, but that's to make sure that everybody has an opportunity to ask and answer. Um, and if you want to ask more than one question, please feel free to do that. But after the first question, after the answer, please get back to the line. The line may be two people. The main line may be 2,444 people long. <laughs> Just a minute. Okay, that was a little overdone, but nonetheless, however long it is, please return back to the line. Again, the idea is we're trying to make sure that everybody has a chance to get their concerns out. Now, a piece of good news. The forum is growing. Not only do we have a new executive director, but that executive director has already increased our membership by 10%, and don't forget that matching grant. We're out there trying to take a marvelous organization and raise the awareness in the community about what we do and why the community should be involved. You know, you can come here and listen to these speakers today and other Mondays throughout the forum season and not pay a thing. Have a cup of coffee, have a lunch, good lunch with great service from wonderful people who we all remember to tip. But you can only ask a question if you're a paid out member of the forum. Now, there's one reason to be a paid out member. You want to ask questions, you want to engage. But there's another reason, and that's supporting this wonderful community effort that I'm very, very honored to be the president. What we're doing is we're trying to engage people, young people, older people, and everybody in the middle in issues in the community. This is the forum to do it. We appreciate the support of our members. We appreciate the job the executive director and the board is doing, getting out there, getting more awareness, more people. And I'm just going to end that little speech with, I want to thank you all for your support. Now today we're looking at three races in Hillsboro for school board. And we unfortunately have two candidates who were unable to attend. In position four, Tim Reeves is not able to attend. And for position number seven, Jaime Rodriguez is unable to attend. attend. I'm sure it's because of circumstances beyond their control. The forum tries to invite everybody. When there's two sides to an issue, we want both. When there's two candidates for a position, we want both. When there's 14 candidates for a position, we want all 14. But we can only invite, and people can only do the best they can to come. So if you're interested in a race and your candidate isn't here, whether you're watching this on camera later or here in the room, please understand that doesn't mean that they're not going to be on the ballot. That doesn't mean that they're not serious. It means that something came up and they were unable to be here today. And again, we've invited everybody. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, we're going to take a look at position four. As soon as I get the opportunity to introduce these folks, I will have to leave today due to a family concern, and our executive director will take over and do almost as capable a job as I am. <laughs> for position number four, we have, unfortunately, Tim Reeves is not here, but we have Christian Honey. If she would come forward, please. Me. Hey. It's Honnold, thank you. <laughs> uh, yes, I'm so sorry about oh, that. No, okay. if, if this common mispronounced name. <laughs> if this very kind and gentle gentleman would come forward. Sure. And if, and I'm not even going to, even though I've shaken her hand, I'm still hesitant to discuss the gender, but if Kim would, Kim Strelchin would come forward, please. Thank you. Right? Yeah. yeah. Well, I got the last name right, and I got the gender right, too. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we have a lady, and we have a gentleman, and we have me casually slinking out. 
Thank you for your kindness, your attention, and for being here. Folks, uh, you have the draw here, and I believe Kim drew to go first. Okay. Thank you. Great. That's a short draw. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Kim Strolchen. Thank you so much for having me here today. I am the current board chair for the Hillsboro School District, and I'm running for my second term um, on the board in position four. I am a product of Washington County Schools. I grew up here, graduated from Beaverton High School, and then received my bachelor's in science from Portland State University. I'm an arts integration coach for Young Audiences of Oregon. Um, we're an organization that works to bring artists and art residencies into the schools in the Tri-County area. My husband and I have lived in Hillsboro now for 20 years. We have two children, a freshman and a senior, who attend Glencoe High School. For the last 15 years, I've devoted my life to education and children. I've been an active volunteer both in and out of classrooms. I've served in a variety of leadership roles, including the Executive Advisory Board at Washington County's largest cooperative preschool, where I served for five years, as Jackson PTA President and Executive Board Member for seven years, and also as a parent club leader at Evergreen Middle School. I was a Stanford Children Leader in Hillsboro for five years, working to improve both school funding and education practices. <coughs> Prior to my board service, I also spent one session as a legislative aide um, in Salem. I served on two school side councils, and I served on multiple school district committees. I have a deep working knowledge of education budgets, policies, and practices at both the local and state level. I'm proud of my first term on the board. Over the past four years, I have promoted what is best for students. Despite the budgetary constraints, we have made great strides in Hillsborough School District. Through targeted investments and a laser focus on strategic goals, the board has guided our district through a very difficult time. We are improving our results for emerging bilingual students and our students in poverty. We have some of the highest graduation rates in the state. We're increasing our education opportunities for students and options, as well as improving our college and career pathways for our secondary students. This includes improving our internship opportunities and bringing even more businesses to the table to provide real life experiences for our high school students. We're utilizing technology to innovate the teaching and learning process for teachers and students in a very smart, cost-effective manner. And we've even made strides in STEAM, science, technology, engineering, arts, and mathematics during this time. I'm running again because I believe we're not done. I believe we are on the right path and we're about to hit a tipping point. I've been a committed board member working to strengthen my knowledge and learn firsthand from students, staff, administrators, and our partners. I make the time to regularly visit schools and attend both board and superintendent events to connect with the community. I have served as board chair for two years and as vice chair the year prior to that. In addition, I've continued to serve on many district level committees. I've built relationships with students and staff, as well as established relationships with many partners from the chamber and business world. With my work on two college and career pathways committees, I'm working with business leaders, the Hillsborough Chamber, and a number of higher education partners, including PCC, Pacific University, and Western Oregon. I am proud of the working relationships I have with locally elected officials at the city level, as well as our state legislators. I have regular meetings with state representatives and visit Salem while they are in session. I understand that creating a world-class education system will take cooperation and collaboration from all of these people. As your board member, I'll continue to be a tireless advocate for our schools, fighting for stable and adequate funding. I will champion improving our educational options for students like we have done with our dual language program and the Hillsborough Online Academy, so we're providing the best options for all students. I will continue working with our public and private partners to further enhance our education system and create meaningful relationships that benefit our students. I will continue to be fiscally responsible, focusing budget decisions on targeted investments that improve student outcomes. I love my work on the school board. I knew that this was going to be a challenging job, and I take my volunteer position very seriously. Advocacy for public education has always been about more than just my two kids, Allie and Lucas. It's about serving all students. I firmly believe that a strong public education system is the heart and soul of a community and of a thriving economy, so the decisions that we are making today will impact Hillsborough and Oregon for decades to come. Over the last four years, we have delivered real results for our students, and I have worked hard to do my homework, ask tough questions, and make informed decisions to help deliver those results. It would be my privilege to continue to serve on this board, and I pledge to keep students at the core of my decisions. 
I will continue to engage members of my community. I will continue to be a responsible steward of our public resources and make sure we are getting the most of our funding with the greatest impact for students. It is my honor to serve on the Hillsboro School Board and I ask for your support on May 19th. Thank you. Hi, um, my name is Christian Honnell. I wanted to thank the forum for giving us the opportunity to talk to you and tell, your, tell a little bit about ourselves and what we want to do for the, the Hillsborough School Board. Uh, growing up in Astoria, my mom was a teacher and my dad was a doctor. And they uh, instilled a high uh, value on education in our family. And they also were very strong on work ethic. We had a saying in our family, work done, then fun. And I always took that mantra that went forward in everything that I do in my life. In addition, my dad was very also trying to be very inspiring. And he would always tell me, Christian, do what you love, and everything else is going to work out. And the first thing I knew I loved was technology. And so I, got, uh, I worked hard to get my degree, an uh, electrical engineering degree at University of Washington. And now I work for Intel to try to shape the future technology for the world we live in. Uh, when I joined Intel, the first thing I, I learned was that I actually enjoyed working with people more than I worked, enjoyed working just with the technology. And trying to find a way to use creative thinking of the people we have and merge that with the technology that we have was something that just drove me going forward. And so I became a manager, uh, and the team that I manage is a customer service organization. So our goal is actually to go gather requirements from the designers at Intel and work to uh, build tools that will enrich the way they do their, their work. In addition to that, we also do training classes. So we build training classes and things to teach them how to be the best that they can at their job. So I, that skill set can directly apply to the board. I can use those same skills that I've learned as Intel to apply to the board. And we have a lot of challenging problems in our district still. And I want uh, to take my strong uh, work ethic, combined with the leadership and management skills that I've learned over the 15 years of being an Intel manager, to uh, work for you guys on the board, community at large. Um, I want to develop the strong relationships with the community, including the business communities, uh, along with teachers and faculty, to pull people together to make the most efficient education we can for our students. Um, I will find uh, creative ways to work with teachers to try to pull, pull in more technology into their classroom. Kim mentioned that we already have some programs. I want to investigate with teachers that there's more that we can do for the teacher-student interaction to enrich their lives in using technology. One of the other aspects of my job as an Intel uh, engineering manager is to hire new talent. And we do university tours. We go to the ones you would, you would think, MIT, Carnegie Mellon, Stanford, but we also go to state universities, University of Washington, Ohio State, University of Texas. And you notice that Oregon State isn't on our top tier list. We do go to Oregon State University, but we found that we don't get a big hit rate from candidates there. And, and for me, it just hits deep, and I want to be able to hit Oregon State and have a good influx of real qualified engineering candidates that we can bring back to uh, Intel to hire. Also as an Intel manager, uh, I've learned that we have to deal with uh, uh, challenging constraints that happen. We have budget constraints, we have resource constraints, we have schedule pressures, uh, and all of these things. And what I do as an Intel manager is pull people together to brainstorm creative ways to solve those problems. And you see, those are very similar to the same problems our schools face. We have budget constraints, we have uh, class sizes that are large, and it's time to pull the community together to work to, to solve those issues. Um, I also feel that there's, we can solve some of those problems with the integration of technology along with creativity of the teachers. Pulling those two things together I think can, can prepare our students for the world that we live in. Um, so, there's work to be done. I'll pull my mantra of work done, then fun, my strong work ethic, to apply that to the school district. I'll use the leadership and management skills that I've developed over the years 
to pull the business community, the world community, the faculty, and all together to do uh, enrich the education of our kids. I want to actually go to Oregon State University and look at a promising candidate and have it see on the, on the resume that I'm looking at that he graduated from the Hillsborough School District. And I know that we can actually make that happen. So vote for me. We'll pull all this experience and passion to work for you. Thank you. Folks, we want to welcome uh, Wayne Clift up here. And uh, in the meantime, I'd like to uh, uh, just ask uh, of the candidates uh, just return to your seats afterwards. And then uh, at the end of each presentation, or at the end of all presentations, we'll have all the candidates back up. And then you, the audience, can ask questions of everybody. So why don't we put our hands together for Wayne? Come on up, Wayne. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for coming this, uh, this morning, this afternoon. Uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to come and talk to you for a few minutes. Uh, my name is Wayne Clift. Uh, I have been a Hillsborough resident for 23 years. Uh, straight out of college, I, my wife and I came to Hillsborough uh, 23 years ago, and we've uh, since been raising four children. Uh, we have uh, two that recently graduated from Hillsborough schools, uh, and two that are still in sixth grade and elementary, twins that uh, keep us busy. Uh, it's been a very exciting seeing the the whole school district, uh, from elementary uh, to uh, to high school, in a very personal way with my own families. It's gone through over the last 20 years being involved with the school district. It's been my pleasure for the last four years uh, to serve on the Hillsborough School District uh, uh, School Board. Uh, I'm currently the vice chair on the board and serve with Kim and others uh, in a very challenging role uh, to bring together the resources of a community uh, to affect the changes that we need uh, to build up what's our most valuable resource, our children and the schools. I was talking uh, recently with uh, uh, people about priorities and how we uh, look at funding in the schools and, and what, what a powerful lever it is that K-12 education is in our communities to solve many of society's ills. Uh, by being able to address early and train and grow and raise uh, our children in an educated way that they can uh, become productive uh, members of society. But, you know, from a personal perspective, I go back uh, uh, a long time. My mother was, uh, as I was raised, I, I grew up in a very small town in the middle of the desert. Uh, my mom was uh, uh, on the school board, and so I, I got a little bit of perspective on what school boards do and how they work. Uh, and it had it always been in the back of my mind as I moved to Hillsborough, which I wouldn't qualify as a small town as I grew up in a small town of 5,000 where I came from. But uh, the unique nature of Hillsborough is uh, the ability to have these tight communities. Uh, have groups uh, that can work together closely for a common cause. And what inspired me about where I grew up uh, was how the community members could participate, even in a small area, uh, participate and invest in the schools uh, to make them better. Uh, and it became a, a personal vision of my own uh, to invest personally, locally in my schools. Uh, and so when we came to Hillsborough, I, I gave my real estate agent a very uh, a specific uh, uh, requirement. I, I, I took the protractor and, and made one mile and two mile circles on the map that said, uh, this is where I work, I need to live where I work. I need to live where I am and to participate in a community. And, she, and we worked it out. We found a place, a beautiful home, uh, where we could raise our family. And it's been very exciting uh, to be committed members of the community. Uh, on the school board, uh, as, I, as I went through my process of uh, learning about the districts and got more and more involved in schools, uh, I have limited time. I have a, a demanding job. I work at Intel. I'm an Intel engineer uh, doing chip design, methodology, uh, work to change how large organizations do things, do their work. Uh, and as struggles came up in the district, I was able to see how, how that experience connected with the district and helping manage change in a large organization. The district at the time, five or six years ago, was going through uh, some very difficult times. And I got involved in uh, attending board meetings. Uh, but it was very frustrating sitting in the back of the room wanting to open my mouth uh, and knowing that if I really had to say something, I'd only get two or three minutes at the, at the podium very much like this. Uh, and uh, it, it drove me uh, through the issues that came up to be a member of the, uh, to run for school board uh, four years ago uh, and have had a wonderful time on it, driving those changes uh, that we need. Uh, the past four years have been very challenging in the district, uh, so we've been able to uh, uh, respond to uh, financial difficulties uh, and make the decisions that we needed to to prioritize effectively the spending to, uh, uh, to keep the programs running and to focus on what's critical. I've had the 
uh, <coughs> pleasure of working uh, on many issues and focusing my time uh, to be able to visit the schools, uh, visit the community in specific ways to learn what I needed to be able to uh, accomplish the goals that we've had. I'll learn more about dual language, and learn more about the STEM programs, learn more about the math programs so that we could make the specific decisions we needed to as a board uh, to drive change in the district. I've been very proud of that experience we've been able to accomplish uh, over the last four years. I'm very excited to return uh, and to provide leadership into the next coming four years uh, to uh, so I'm here today uh, looking uh, for your vote, for your support, and for uh, to bring our communities together uh, so that we can uh, continue to serve the members of the, of the public in Hillsborough and bring uh, the best schools to our community. Thank you. Uh, folks, up next we have position five. And appearing in this order, Lisa Allen, Mark Rask, Christopher Berry. Lisa, would you come up, please? important it really is crucial it's a it's a pivotal time um, so first I'll just start I'll tell you a little bit about myself and why I'm running I am a parent I have been a classroom teacher I'm also a volunteer in our community and in our school district and you know I grew up in a really low-income neighborhood and I went to a very low performing low-income school unfortunately uh, most of my friends that I had as a child didn't graduate from high school with me when I walked across the stage um, but I had some great teachers, I had some great friends, I had a wonderful family, and I was the first in my family to go to college and graduate. <clears throat> I was really lucky because after that I was accepted into Teach for America, which is a really competitive organization, and I was able to be a classroom teacher. So it was a life-changing experience for me. It was amazing to be able to have the kind of impact that a teacher has on a life. Um, but it was really hard as well. 100% of my students lived below the poverty line. And so again, I saw too many of them not graduating from high school. Uh, there were success stories. We were able to support a lot of students. And uh, one example is a student of mine named Michael, who actually just recently found out that he was accepted into Teach for America. He also applied, and he will be a classroom teacher next year himself. So that's really weird because he used to be like a little kid. But it's also great. So, um, you know. You guys know as community leaders that in order to have really strong communities, we have to have thriving schools, right? They're very connected. We can do that together. But right now in Hillsborough, the problem is that 19 out of every 100 students in our school district don't get to put on a cap and gown. They don't get to walk across a stage. Nobody hands them a diploma. They don't get to graduate. That's 19% of our students that we are failing. We can fix that very easily, actually, by doing a couple things intentionally. Number one is supporting our college and career pathways program so students have a clear path to success. And the second thing is expanding our career education offerings for our students so that they understand that high school is a place they want to be and they can still be successful even if they choose not to go to college, right? So <clears throat> if we do those things, we can give those kids a chance. And some students I'll tell you about that highlight this very well. First, a student like Sarah, who graduated in 2013 from Century High School. She just recently realized and learned that she earned a full ride scholarship to Pacific University next year. What I love, of course, about Sarah's story is that that wouldn't be possible if it weren't for the Future Connect program that we participate in in our district. So she had really great support going through the process as a first generation college student to complete her transfer degree at PCC. Now she's ready to take on the world next year at Pacific for free amazing but we need more opportunities for students like Sarah and that's exactly what the College and Career Pathways program can do if we do it right. And the second piece of this is really personal for me it's career education. We really need to have students get more exposure to careers so they can get good jobs. And I'll tell you why it's personal. Um, I told you about my neighborhood growing up and most of my friends didn't graduate. Uh, one of those friends is my own brother. He didn't make it with me to graduation. He dropped out. 
And the road for him to figure out what he wanted to do was long and it was rough and uh, it was a tough time for our family, right? He now is very happy, very successful. He's a master carpenter, but our school didn't have any career education growing up, so he didn't have that exposure. He lost that opportunity and many years. There are students like that in Hillsboro right now who need more exposure to career education. I met one of them recently when I was at Hill High on a visit. Thank you. Um, I was touring the Auto Lab, which is the only one in our district, um, and I met a student named Miguel. <coughs> Miguel shared with me how much being in that auto program has meant to him. It has changed his life because he has learned that he is a leader. He didn't know that before. He can take something that's broken and he can fix it. He can teach someone something really difficult. He can lead a group on a really complicated project. He can lead. Hill High does something called College Application Week, where students make a plan for after graduation. And what Miguel realized during this week is that he wants to dedicate his new leadership skills to a life of service. So after graduation, he's going to join the military, and he'll be spending his career serving our country as a Marine. Now, that makes him really proud, of course, as he should be. And we should be proud, too, as members of the community that helped him do that. But there are still 19% of our students were not serving. College and career pathways and career education could have helped my brother years ago. Right? It did, as it is, help Sarah and help Miguel be successful. And if we do it right, it can help hundreds of students over the coming years. But we need the right leadership on the school board. That's why I'm running for the Hillsborough School Board and why I was brought here today. So thank you. Bart Rask, are you in the house? Come on up. Thank you for having me. I just got back from work. I'm not retired yet. So my name is Bart Rask. Um, the biggest thing, I'm a, I'm a family man. I'm old, but I'm a father of six. Five of my kids are in the Hillsboro School District, four at West Union, one at Pointer. And my daily life consists of after work is taking kids to soccer, gymnastics, baseball, etc. Changing, I still change diapers even though I have gray hair. But, um, and that, oh, also, uh, my involvement in the community has been pretty extensive. I finished school in, I'm an orthopedic surgeon. I finished school in 1998 and I became the head of the sports medicine department of Tuolumne. And, immediate, and then I brought some tools back from my training back east. And one of the tools I brought back was a preseason physical program. It was the first in the state where um, a group of doctors volunteer and we uh, run kids through it. At the time it was $5, now I think it's $20, to get their preseason physicals done in time for their sports over a two-day period. And it greatly increased the speed and ease of getting kids ready for uh, their school. Uh, a little bit more about me. I grew up in Southeast Portland, graduated from Benson High School, went to Oregon Colleges, did my orthopedic surgery training on the East Coast. Now, what do I want to do? Why am I involved with this? Uh, like all the candidates, we want to make things better. The question is how do we make things better? I have some ideas. Of course, they would have to be in cooperation with colleagues, and my ideas will be, have to be refined as I learn more about how things are done. But key things I want to do in order to help improve achievement is decreasing class sizes. Uh, of my five children, uh, my second grader has uh, 26 in his class. My sixth grader has 37, and it's a 5-6 split. Of course, he doesn't get much attention. It's half the class is his grade, and uh, since it's 37 kids, even less than that. Now, there was a big talk about an achievement gap, and I have an achievement gap in my own family. My second grader doesn't do too well. He has a very poor attention. He literally will lie down on the floor and kind of twirl around while the teacher's trying to instruct him. Well, I have a fifth grader who does pretty well. He's near the top of his class. And my second grader, this is, I'm giving you a micro example to illustrate a macro point. My second grader, uh, I received an email from his teacher saying he hasn't done his homework in a couple weeks. And, and I didn't know that because he, he says, we ask him if he does homework and he says he doesn't have any and we, he lies. And so we found out that he does 
and I go over it with him. I have him sit with me next to him, and then, then I get an email back from his teacher the next day saying how well Mark was doing and how attentive he was. What did you do to him? What happened? Well, the, the point was that I, I was able to spend time with him and he was able to get attention. So I think a key point in closing the achievement gap or even raising achievement for everyone is attention. And that can be helped by lowering class sizes. How am I going to do that? Well, that requires going over the budget, helping get more money, and reprioritizing, and that would involve, and I don't have the details worked out, that would be, have to be involved working out with colleagues. That's number one. Number two, um, alternate career pathways. There's a big push on pushing everyone or most people toward college. Everyone knows college isn't for everyone. Having gone to Benson, I don't know if many of you are familiar with Benson High School, used to be rated as the top high school, technical high school in the country, and because kids have an alternative to go to if they don't go to college, maybe technical. And it turned out pretty well for many of my high school classmates. So I guess the best thing, since time is short, is the main, number one thing I want to do is improve achievement. And if I were to do one thing, hopefully by decreasing class sizes. That's all. Thank you. Christopher Berry, come on up. Thanks for moving the laptop. <laughs> no worries. I'm glad it still works. <laughs> Good afternoon. I'm Chris Berry, and um, I'm running for uh, position five of the Hillsborough School Board. And I'd like to thank all of you, ladies and gentlemen, for having and hosting this forum. And I know some of you have been involved with the forum for many years, some not so many years, but it's an important avenue for candidates to be able to uh, come before the public and express their, um, their passions in life and why they're running for the positions they're running for. So thank you for your involvement and for growing and maintaining the forum. So, um, why am I running for the Hillsboro School Board? I currently am, uh, sit on the Budget Committee, and uh, the reason I wanted to get involved with the Hillsboro School Board Budget Committee is because I have three children. I have a 20-year-old, a 16-year-old, and an 8-year-old. And my children have attended eight different schools within the Hillsboro School District because of us moving around over the years. And so I've had lots of opportunities to speak with teachers, principals, counselors, lots of students, lots of friends who come over, lots of friends' parents. And we talk about the issues that are concerning them and issues that are concerning me. And the main reason I got involved with the school district was because I wanted to find out what the truth was. How many people in here heard, you know, the school district has enough money to do all the things that need to be done to educate our kids? Why aren't they doing it? Has anybody heard that argument? How many people have heard the argument, well, you know, we need smaller class sizes, we don't have enough money, we need to hire more teachers, we need more, 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 right? How many have heard that argument? Who knows what the truth is? You won't know until you actually go to a board meeting, turns out. And so I got involved and I wanted to find out, you know, where are the sources of funding and where, did, where does that money go? So I am educating myself as I'm attending the board meetings and seeing through the work sessions, and, and it's pretty interesting. Turns out it's more complicated than either one of those polar positions would suggest. And it requires a tremendous amount of uh, passion to be able to work through the problems because there's a ton of issues that are coming up. We've got you know a whole section of Hillsboro that's going to be punched out, and we're going to have what, 4,800, 4,500, 4,800 uh, new students in a population of 20,000 people. That's a big topic that needs to be discussed and we need to plan how we're going to bring that section of Hillsboro into the school district and do it in a way that is not uh, as, you know, not very stressful. It's gonna be stressful, just straight out. <laughs> but it doesn't have to be stressful if people talk about the issues and work through the problems. So one of the other reasons I'm running is because I have a fairly decent amount of background serving on boards and committees. Um, so I, I won't go through my whole uh, resume, but I've, I've presided over a state association uh, uh, of mortgage professionals. I work in mortgage banking. I was the past president of the Oregon Association of Mortgage Professionals. And we got together and we passed a law back in 2000, 2001 that required <laughs> 
uh, education, uh, entry level education, and continuing education of loan originators in the state of Oregon, as well as criminal background checks. This took a lot of time, but more importantly, it took a lot of getting people to the table so we could talk about what it was that we were going to do and how we were going to do it. And we were opposed by another trade organization, but we eventually got it through because the legislators in Salem knew that it was the right thing to do to protect the public. And um, so I have that, that experience as well as uh, currently serving as the uh, president of the Sheriff's Office Foundation of Washington County, where we manage uh, money that's contributed to uh, to the foundation and we help to support uh, sheriff's office functions that are not uh, in the general budget. And Emily and I serve together on the uh, board for Open Door Housing Center, which is a housing education and emergency homeless shelter. So I'm pretty actively involved in the community. I'm gonna have to withdraw from some of these other obligations to serve on the board. But I believe our kids are the primary focus and everything else is in support of them. So that will be where I focus my attention. And I um, just want to ask you for your support. Thanks again for the opportunity to be here. And um, I see my, my 30 seconds are up, so I'll <laughs> go ahead and cede my time to the next person. But uh, thank you very much for, for having me. Folks, we're going to make sure everybody's on the same page when it comes to procedures. Joseph, could you help make sure that we've got three additional chairs up here, and I'd like to call all the candidates to the front to answer questions. I would ask that everyone in the room acknowledges the fact that you have to be a paid-up forum member to ask questions, and it is our custom to announce that you are your name, forum member, and then proceed with the question. We're gonna, because we have a lot of candidates here today, we're gonna keep a leash on the questions, and here's how we're gonna do that. First, you as forum members are going to ask your question in 30 seconds or less. If you exceed 30 seconds, we'll cut your mic and we'll move on to the next question. <laughs> and then you may throw silverware at us. Um, next, candidates, would you please keep your response to one minute or less? My last request for you in the audience is twofold. One, if you've got a cell phone on, please turn it off. And second, as you announce your question, if it's directed to more than one of the candidates, please announce that so that we don't have every candidate answering every question. So if you've got a focus, please direct it. And with that being said, Jim, would you take it away with our first question? Jim Kate, floor member, can all the candidates discuss the proposed land swap between the Hillsborough School District and the Beaver School District? Thank you. We can just go in order, Chris, <coughs> first. Oh, no, you're Chris, too. Yeah, so. yeah. Uh, we can do it together. Um, so yes, the uh, proposed land swap is, um, I personally, I think it makes uh, sense geographically to swap land from the Beaverton School District to the Hillsborough School District. And remember, we're keeping the kids, um, the students, and their families as the primary focus. It shouldn't be about money or influence or anything like that, but it makes logistical sense to, um, to look seriously at that. So I'm still looking at and listening to other people's positions on it, but it's a very compelling um, idea. Yeah, I attended the last school board meeting and, and saw that there was a lot of tension uh, that or, or surrounded this. And so there's a lot of emotions and a lot of uh, energy around this, and there's a lot of personal feelings that go into it. So we first thing we have to do is make sure that everybody is included in the discussion, make sure the community understands what's going on, and then look really to do what, what is best for the kids. And there are some logistical benefits, there are some other benefits that, that, that go towards it, and as a board member, I think that the best thing we can do is make sure the community is included, make sure everybody is, is on that topic, and that we are doing the right thing for the kids. So as we analyze the uh, proposal, it's, um, it's complicated in that there is, I mean, it's a business on one sense, and you have to have an understanding of um, something that's uh, a swap works for. I think the biggest takeaway I've had so far, um, as we're just starting to analyze how many families are impacted in the current proposal, is um, the piece of land that was proposed, the families who are impacted weren't aware that they were being proposed. And so I think the trick to uh, any swap or change of boundaries to really have a clear, um, open, transparent 
process so that everyone who's potentially impacted uh, it has a piece of that. And so I think that's our goal moving forward is how do we make sure that all the residents who potentially are impacted have a voice in the matter. Yeah, there's nothing more personal than a boundary changes. A boundary changes to an internal school. Uh, this is a boundary change to a, a district. It's a, uh, ultimately, uh, what's critical is that we're doing the right thing for our students, uh, making sure that uh, they have uh, received the best education possible. Uh, the, on this boundary uh, change, the important thing will be for us to gather the information, as, as many have said, uh, and have the appropriate discussion. Uh, I think it's important to have these kind of discussions uh, to make sure that uh, we fully understand uh, the, the implications of what we're doing without leaping into uh, to anything. Uh, boundary changes are sometimes a good solution uh, to existing problems, and I think uh, an important thing that hasn't been mentioned uh, so far uh, is the long-range planning aspect of it. Uh, Any time that there are significant uh, boundary changes, either internally to uh, inside lines of, a, of existing schools uh, or uh, on a on a district boundary level, uh, the kind of decisions we have to make have to be done well in advance so we can plan facilities and other things. So advanced planning will be critical. Everything I've read was has been positive. Um, it seems to make geographic sense. From what I saw on the on the maps is that uh, Beaverton has five schools in the next that area. Uh, Hillsboro's closest is Groner, which is much farther away from all five of Beaverton schools. So it seems they would cut down in infrastructure and transportation costs. So, so far I'm positive for it. However, I have not heard the devil's advocate response, so I, my mind can change. <laughs> I can, I'll take a toe, sure. You can actually just pull it down. Yeah. All of you candidates, you can actually just grab this, this twist it, move it, and get close to your face. Thank it helps you. us do sound. Um, so thanks for the question. That's a great question, a big issue that's happening right now. First, there's a lot more to a boundary change or a, a land, uh, seeding land, than just whether it makes geographic sense. We have to take into account what's best for all of the students in our school district. And so right now, I haven't seen a final proposal that actually has the relevant information, which is what is the long-term impact on the funding of our school district? If we see this land that we developed with high property value homes, we're losing out on those property taxes. So we need to look at the land that we'd be getting and look at the comparableness of the, comparableness isn't a word, look at how comparable the value of that land is so that we know what we're getting ourselves into. If it mathematically makes sense, then I'd be happy to vote for it. If not, then I wouldn't. Thank you. Everybody answered? I yep, so. so. Okay. Sally, give us a question. Okay. okay. Um, when, when, our, when, our two, when our two sons went to, through school, they, were, they had an outdoor school. They, there were opportunities to go, go to the art museum, the historical, uh, historical society, OMSI. None of that exists. Oh, and then the favorite one for fourth graders was Lenuska. I mean, this was an, this was an Indian, uh, they made, made masks. What, what opportunity is, is there today for students that can see things for real and not on a screen? And is that question for all candidates? Uh, all candidates. <laughs> Same order, please. Same order. <laughs> that that's a great question, and you know, as as um, as time moves on, things change, and so what is interesting to people at a certain time might not be so interesting to kids later, although we have a connection to it. Um, I, I share a lot of those experiences, and I would like to see our young people share those experiences as well. Um, and that's not to say those aren't good experiences, but there are other experiences as well. And I do know that the kids are getting, you know, my, my son is going to a, um, uh, the Portland Children's uh, Playhouse or something, De downtown Portland, he's gonna go see a play, and that's happening this Friday. And so kid, kids are involved in things. It may just be different you know, now than it was um, you know, when, when you were growing up. And, and in different generations, they have a different experience. So, but I do see that kids are getting those experiences where they're able to go out on field trips. However, field trips are difficult to put together these days because of all the things that you have to sign off on and you know, the, the busing and all that. So great question. 
Yeah, so thanks for your question. I, I too remember actually as a student going on many field trips in, in Astoria and doing some of those fun events and things. And, and it is, you know, for, for kids to actually see and, and be able to touch things and look at things and, and experience them personally, I agree with you. I think that's a strong value. Um, I will look on the board and I'll look to see what we are doing, make sure that that's happening, and see if there's other opportunities where we might be able to do those things. But we have to also balance, you know, like uh, Chris was saying, the, the budget constraints and things that go into that, but it is a worthwhile thing. We should do, we should do something. Um, so I think that absolutely there's budgetary constraints, but there are a couple places where we're still doing those items. So we partner with the Northwest Regional EM ESD. So our sixth grade students are getting an outdoor experience. It's not a full week like um, I remember as a student in Weaverton, but it is a couple days where everyone is getting an opportunity to go. Uh, principals have discretionary funds in their building that some will often use for field trips um, or parent club organizations who will help support field trips. We found really smart about how do you spend those dollars so sometimes rather than going to OMSI, OMSI can bring a presentation to you so kids still get a hands-on experience but in a little bit more cost-effective way and you don't have a loss of time from travel. <coughs> So um, I think a lot of those things are happening. It's a little trickier in our schools where there's a high poverty, so you might not have a parent organization or a club that can help support those items. And we're always looking for community partners to um, help us that, to help everyone wrap their arms around the school so that every student's receiving those experiences. Yes, I wanted to also uh, say, assure you that there are many good programs going on. Uh, I've been able to attend uh, plays in downtown Portland uh, uh, with students. Uh, also, I know that uh, some form of outdoor school, my kids have also been involved in uh, for many years, including uh, this year. Uh, also, an interesting new one that has come up is uh, they call it BizTown, uh, where the kids all for a month or more practice and uh, prepare to take on positions in a mini community. Uh, and then uh, at the event, they go in and their office managers and tax collectors and business people back and forth all. Uh, playing through the process of what does it mean to interact with money. So just some good examples. These are, these are driven uh, through the passions of teachers and the passions of community, uh, community effort. Uh, fundraising is often a part of the process now. Uh, uh, the funds aren't always necessarily coming from the district, but uh, through creative and, and strong wills of effort, uh, we've been able to make many good programs available for our students. Uh, and uh, I've been excited about you know, being able to be involved in participating in those. We'll continue to do that. Well, I don't know how much of an issue that is. Uh, my kids go to outdoor school, they go to the rock museum, they go to plays, and so I'm not sure if it's a real problem. It could be, but in my experience, it hasn't seemed to be. It seems like every other week I'm getting a notice asking for permission for my for a waiver for my kid to go, to, <laughs> go somewhere. So. I don't see it as a problem, but I'm open to change my mind if there's other input. I, I see it as a problem, particularly for the children of the homeless and that the, the just don't have those kinds of opportunities. Uh, are the homeless, aren't the homeless in the system and do the same thing as the other kids? I don't know. Again, if the homeless can't do it, I'm all in favor of funding them to do it as well. I'll learn how to do it by the third question, I promise, so maybe. Um, so I think that the, the big thing is, you know, we do have some offerings, right? But it, it has changed even from when I was in school, and most of that is funding. Uh, you may or may not know that in six years before last year, our school district had $70 million in cuts cut from the budget, and that's, that's not an exception. That's the rule in districts throughout the state. So, um, you know, we do do outdoor schools, everybody else has mentioned, so I won't talk much about that. Um, I've been visiting all the schools in the district, and I know that a lot of our elementary school students just went to see the Aurora Colony. Um, and I've also seen people bringing folks in, as was mentioned. You know, I've seen um, the, a lot of schools, like at W.L. Henry, they have the Right Brain Initiative. So there's a photographer in the classroom actually doing an art lesson that was tied to their unit and, and what was happening. So they got that real world experience. Um, I was at Newberry, and they had like four Intel employees. They're cool blue shirts, and they were in there doing this really awesome hands on science lesson, and the kids were way, it was like, they were really into it. It was amazing. So they maybe didn't get to go to OMSI, but they still had that real world experience and that connection with our local community. So um, it's definitely not perfect, and I'm sure that we can do more, absolutely, but, um, but we are doing, doing a little bit right now, at least. Thank you. 
I'm Marilyn McWilliams, I'm a forum member. Um, my question is, I keep hearing people talk about budget, budget, you know, that we can't do this, we can't do that. And ever since Measure 5 passed, schools have not had adequate, stable funding. It goes year to year, never knowing what you could budget for the next year, never being able to make a long range plan. Um, how would each of you work with the legislature to make sure that we get the, the bulk of our funding, of course, comes from the legislature, to make sure that we get adequate, stable funding? <laughs> I get to go first on this one, Matt. <clears throat> wow, that's a, that's a great question. And uh, I don't know if there is an absolute solution other than everybody needs to get together and talk about how to fix the problem. And until we can remove some of the political ideology from the discussions and the predisposition to you know, want to be confrontational about things, it's gonna be hard to build a consensus to fix the issue. So, and that's one of the things that I have learned to hone in my experience working in, on boards and being involved in boards is building consensus amongst the, the, the people in the room, the people who have the power to vote, talking to them individually so that we're all on the same page, listening to what their concerns are. That is a big part of what's not happening in, in Salem and, and to some extent in other political organizations is people don't stop long enough to listen. You know, they're too busy talking. And you can't represent the people that vote for, for you, and, and in this case, representing those students, without listening to the parents and what their concerns are. And that's one of the things I will promise to do. Um, so you're right, there's a major problem. So I'll talk to you about a little bit about what I did before I was on the board and as a board member. Talk to people in Salem who are elected a lot. You call them a lot. You email them a lot. Um, and in this specific session, a lot of pushback because I think there was a desire by legislators to give us a number early, thinking that was going to save us time and money. And when it's not the right number, it doesn't save you time and money because there's this promise or hope that something else may come in May, which means then if it does come in May, you go back to the drawing boards and you start your budget again. You can't continue, you can't complete your bargaining negotiations with your contracted employees because you don't know the number and they're holding out for a bigger number. Um, and so uh, what I have done is regularly talk with my representatives. Uh, and we're, sir, we're a very large geographical district, so that means you're talking to a lot of people. It's not a representative and a state senator. It's um, you know eight, nine representatives, five senators to really indicate to them what those cuts mean to us and I'll just keep doing that. That that is a, a very challenging problem and, and one of the, the best ways that you can that we can address that as board members is building relationships with the people in Salem. Is and making sure you know who the congressmen are, you know who the senators are, uh, and you're talking with them not just when the budget comes up, but year round on issues that you're facing and things like that. And really building that strong tie is gonna be critical to getting these type of things through. Then you wanna do during the budget crunch times is community outreach. Getting people to tell the, the legislatures what they value. The legislatures are representing them as well, just like we're representing the, board, the, the Hillsborough District. And we need to make sure that, that those voices are heard in the legislature. And so getting that together Pulling that, and if we can get a community together and even go down to Salem and testify during the, the times where they're debating these things, that's gonna show the, the strength and the value that the community has and needs for those things. And so I wanna try to work to do all those things, build the strong relationships and get the community together. Yeah, I, I alluded to this in my opening statement, but it, uh, about the criticality of talking with your legislators. Uh, I was, Last week, uh, after many emails and trading emails with them, I uh, had a conversation with Susan McLean about the uh, criticalness of prioritizing K-12 education. Uh, they have a big budget that they're managing, and uh, the importance of focusing, uh, if they want to solve society's ills in a big picture uh, method, K-12 
K-12 is one of the biggest levers we have uh, in educating our students and preparing them uh, for career and college pathways uh, to make them successful and then uh, contributing members of society. And, and spending the money, they're prioritizing it up front uh, is the strongest message that I could give uh, to, the, to the, our legislators. Uh, honestly, uh, we have a, I call it a 13-year development cycle. We have students uh, that we're trying to develop a curriculum for that they can succeed in the time that we have with them. Uh, and it's, it's very difficult to, to manage that 13-year process on a two-year uh, uh, budget cycle. Uh, and uh, it's critical for us to, uh, to work with them to prioritize K-12 first and manage the rest after as the main way of uh, solving the society's problem here. I won't get repetitive. Everybody's basically saying lobby legislature, and I agree with that. Uh, I, another thing you could add to it is just show them mathematically how well the money is being spent and how it's not being wasted, and I, I think that might be useful. Also, one other thing, there's uh, going to be the occasional good year or two years of boom years where there'll be a little bit more income coming in than anticipated. And if that, if or when that happens, that excess money shouldn't automatically just be spent. It should be stored away a little bit for the inevitable down years. Promised, so there you go. All right, <clears throat> so good question. Thank you. That's a huge issue that's facing our district right now and districts across the state, as I already mentioned. So I won't repeat what I already said, but I have relationships with the legislators who represent Hillsborough um, and been blessed to have their support of my candidacy. And I've had some really tough conversations with them about the funding that they gave to our school district and how inadequate it is. They know that it's not enough. They know that that's not the number that we need, but it's the best that they can do right now. One thing that they always say when I, you know, when we're having this conversation about it's not enough is, well, if we give you more, right, for the K-12 allocation, we have to take it from somewhere else. So where do you want us to do that from? Because there's not an easy answer to that. So I've been digging in a little bit. So I'm prepared to start in May when I'm elected, harassing them for the next biennium, and I will do it all the time, continuously, so they give us what we need because it starts very early. That's something that I learned. Um, so, you know, we used to have almost half of, of the entire general fund for, for the state for K-12 education. Now we're down to the 30s. Uh, the lottery fund used to go significantly to schools, and that's been decreased by millions and millions, hundreds of millions of dollars. So I'm going to be digging more into that and drafting some specific proposals to help them see the light and give us what we need. Thank you. Uh, so you are going to interrupt me. You're going to be the last question. Can you ask this as a yes or no for the candidates? <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> can, you, can you keep it quick? Uh, my, my question will be quick, but the only you know, is more time it takes. Thank you. Uh, in the next few years, the Hill Road School District will be uh, adopting new science curriculum. Uh, uh, one of you will have a one or more of you will have a say in, in uh, what textbook it is that's going to be chosen. Uh, well, one of these science books uh, allow for the teaching of evolution in the public school class. What's your position on teaching on evolution to, to the children? About evolution to the children. Thanks. I'll sit down while you talk. <laughs> um, so, you know, textbooks, when, when they are approved, are full of lots of different information. And um, you know, teaching creationism versus evolution or any other ism, um, I suppose, could, um, could be just one factor. Um, my feeling is, upon uh, you know, condition of, of reviewing one of these textbooks for approval, I would want to read it in its entirety and not just take a piece out and you know, throw the whole thing away. So um, you know, it's important that we look at how these kids are going to be you know, receiving this information. Uh, there are some people who believe that you know religion should be um, provided at home. I'm not so certain that. Uh, in fact, I'm, I'm pretty sure that there is a problem when you start you know teaching something else on the school level because of the the conflict of separation of church and state. So we kind of get into that conversation. But um, I would want to read the text in its entirety before I weighed in uh, opinion for or against. 
So I think one thing to keep in mind when we're picking um, curriculum is we have to meet state standards. So if the state standards include that you have to include um, evolutionism, you do that. And I think we've gotten really well, um, done a good job of creating uh, clear communication to parents and families. So if there's a unit they're concerned about that they would not like their child to participate in, we provide an option for that. Um, but again, it, we're very much guided by state standards. <coughs> Yeah, I don't have a lot to add other than Kim actually answered this quite well, and which is, you know, you do have to meet the state standards. You have to put those things into the curriculum. They will be evaluated on that and tested on that. So we have to make sure that we are teaching the things that are in those priorities. And one thing you can do, you know, at least from my point of view, is, is I've looked at both you know, creationism and evolution. And if you look, sometimes there's a tie between the two. And if you work with parents and things like that to tell them that this is the state standard and this is what we need to be putting in the schools, but at the same time, you know, they can teach their kids, you know, the things that they value and believe. And sometimes you can even find where those two things can melt together, right, and help educate the way, you know, your values show. It's hard to build on this. Uh, standards drive the, the content of the textbooks. But the point I wanted to make was uh, what I want to drive in our students is a critical thinking. Uh, and I've had more than one textbook in my life uh, with content in it that I didn't agree with or didn't believe in. Uh, and uh, it wasn't my position to go out and rant and rave and, and make the textbook change. What my position is that uh, we need to teach our students critical thinking skills uh, so that they can look at their own moral values, look at their uh, scientific values, if, if that's a term, uh, and apply uh, good judgment based on all that they believe on, on what to extract from the textbooks. I'm really excited about textbook adoptions If we need a new curriculum, uh, and we just had a very positive experience with the math curriculum uh, going, uh, uh, going through and completing. Uh, textbooks are a brand new world in an online age, uh, and uh, there's a lot of great opportunities uh, for a new curriculum. Uh, that can be updated actively uh, uh, via online techniques. Uh, so we have opportunities uh, to uh, correct uh, uh, whether you believe Pluto is a planet or not, uh, it can uh, come in or out without having to uh, uh, rewrite a textbook over it. Uh, there's many good opportunities. I'm really excited to uh, have the students have the material that will help them in school. Well, believe it or not, I actually wrote a textbook on that subject, and I'm a reviewer for a medical journal. You can look it up on Amazon. Um, there are, the, the issue regarding evolution, I, I disagree with the way it's taught. When I was on the curriculum committee, I looked over the information, and there's a lot of, um, it's not taught in a very scientifically rigorous way. Again, I have a degree in biology, I'm a reviewer for a medical journal. And the way it's presented is not very scientifically rigorous. There, there's a, the number one issue is there's a conflation between microevolution, in which there's evidence for, and macroevolution, in which there is no empiric evidence for, and the textbooks conflate one ev evidence for one for the evidence for the other. And so it has to be taught, and it should be taught, but the way it is taught is not scientifically rigorous and needs to be gone over. Thank you for your question. Uh, we did just have a great experience with the math curriculum, and I'm the chair of the Citizens Curriculum Advisory Committee, so I played a small role in that, and I'm really proud of the work that we did. Um, you know, we've all, everybody said, you know, oh, we have to abide by the standards, and that's true, but nobody has mentioned that there are actually consequences if we don't. If we are out of compliance with the Oregon state standards, that risks the funding of our school district. We could lose millions of dollars if we don't comply with those standards. And uh, my opponent over there did in fact write a book, and uh, what he didn't tell you is he's twice testified before the school board and asked them not to adopt curriculum that aligns with the state standards because it contains information about evolution. I think that's irresponsible and it's unacceptable. It's not something that I would do. I would never put the funding of our school district in jeopardy. Thank you. Folks, let's give our candidates a hand. up real quick. Um, you know, it's really difficult for people to run for office, so I'm going to ask for another round of applause for these amazing candidates. These guys work really hard. Come on, give them a hand. I want to let you know that uh, next week uh, our candidates for school board for April 20th are Beaverton School District Zone 3, candidates Melissa Potter and Eric Simpson. Zone 6, candidates Daniel Vasquez, Becky Timchuk, and John Smoza. 
Also, Zone 7 candidates Linda Degman and Andrew Beach will be appearing. Thanks for being here. See you next week. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Bye.